Hello and welcome to Passion for Moms uh, webinar series, Mothers Are Leaders. And today I am thrilled and excited to have our guest with us, Jill Sheets. Jill, welcome to our seminar series. We've been doing this for several weeks now and it's been so fun to have these conversations with moms of all ages and stages and just to highlight and recognize that moms are leaders. We're the leaders of this generation and we are preparing the world changers that are gonna be the leaders um, of tomorrow's generation. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, awesome. Well, tell us and our audience just a little bit about yourself. Tell us um, how many kids you have um, and what even this quarantine season has been like for you. Well, I um, grew up in Waco where Shimon did and um, met my husband in Austin and moved here. He went to PT school at Elon and we've been married for 14 years now and uh, had four kids in four years, which was really Wow, hard. you have your hands full, Jill. Uh, it's an adventure. They're all close in age, but they're all getting older, so it's gonna, it's getting easier. They're all potty trained now. That was the highlight of our Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> That's Everybody a huge potty. praise the Lord, right? <laughs> as soon as you say something like that, though, somebody's gonna regress, and you're just gonna regret ever bragging that someone in your house was potty trained. But uh, So we live in Durham, North Carolina, and have uh, for the last 12 years, and um, attend the Summit Church uh, and have tons of, my husband's oldest of four boys, so there's um, his three younger brothers who all have families here within 30 minutes of us. So it's, all of our family has moved here since we've been here, and it is um, heavenly. That is amazing. As we were just chatting um, offline before we got started, um, I am so envious of you as far as having that network of at the relationships you have built in with your family and with cousins right there. And just um, what a blessing that is to be able to grow up with that kind of camaraderie and friendship for your kids. It is, it is. Um, we, we were here, um, we moved here first and then the siblings just kind of ended up, ended up here. And we were just sitting around the lake house, um, all of us moms and sister-in-laws who all married brothers. And we're just saying, wow, uh, we, <laughs> we couldn't be thankful for anything more than um, a, sister, a sister bond that's better and closer than even some sisters enjoy. I mean, it is just, it's amazing. And we've been very, very thankful for that, so. Yeah, what a blessing. Um, I mean, that is a gift that not many people actually get to experience in life. And so, um, yeah, I am, Jealous, but so grateful that you have that of just that um, friendship and uh, relationships with in-laws and um, sister-in-laws. What a gift. And it's a God thing too. It's not necessarily something that always came easy. God really had to work in us many times too. So it's a great, exciting testimony too. So you said you have four children and what's the age range? Which, what's the age of your oldest? Avery, my daughter Avery is the oldest, she's eight, Stella okay. is six, and then I have boy-girl twins uh, that are uh, four, uh, Benham and Annabelle. So three girls and a boy, and um, yes, they, they keep us on the ball. So what has this season looked like for you um, as far as it can be um, already an adventure? with those ages and four um, children that close in age. So it, life can already be an adventure. What has the season looked like for you um, with this global pandemic that we're going through? And has it been um, stressful? Has it been a challenging or maybe even in some ways refreshing or eye-opening? What does that look like for you and your family? Well, we spent, um, we spent the first week or two in Texas, so it, it was more like a vacation. The, my twins had flown down to visit my parents um, and flown home with my sister. So we had to go to Texas to get them, pandemic or not, because they couldn't just stay there indefinitely. <laughs> Neither of us wanted that. So we spent that first week and a half in Texas, and my parents live out in the country, 
and the kids thought it was awesome. So we, they didn't even know uh, it, we did what we would have done anyway, and then drove home and just never stopped uh, <laughs> anywhere public. And, um, and, and then it, so ours started a week or two later than everybody else's. That was also our spring break. So we weren't, I was seeing all of these pictures of people saying, homeschooling. Um, and I, I was homeschooled a little bit as a kid, and um, I still tip my hat to my mother who survived that and did it well. Um, I don't think I'm quite gifted in that in that area, but I know lots of us are learning that. So um, we were a couple of weeks later. We didn't start till April um, in the um, homeschooling phase of it, but um, it's it's been an adventure. Three years ago, though, we. Um, outgrew our house with two dogs and four kids and found this house on five acres that was a complete fixer upper and and just dump but so we it had land though and and lots of fun wooded acres outside so um we have not have we have never been more thankful for that than now when the kids just play outside a whole lot and just so thankful for the weather that i mean it's not december that we're all holed up in here it's right. March and April and beautiful times and everybody can plant things and um, we've been very thankful for so much um, ability to be outside and then also thinking and praying for people who are in apartment complexes or um, places where you can't go outside safely or you can't go play in the dirt or dig in the grass and and things like that so we've enjoyed being outside. Mm. And that's so, um, that's one of the things that I've continued to, um, to try to encourage people with, whether it's my own family or just recognizing that with any trial and any um, desert experience that we face, because we are all going to have challenges in our life. This happens to be a global challenge, but we're all going to face things in our life that are hard and we're all going to have to learn how to do hard things well. And to be able to do that with joy and with grace and, um, and not to downplay the challenges that people are going through, whether it's um, living in more confined places or health issues or financial issues. You know, we've walked through those um, as a family. And so I know it's hard, but at the heart of any trial, we all have a choice in how we face uh, trials and to be able to choose joy in every situation and just recognize that God's mercies are new every morning um, regardless of the circumstances that we're going through. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things, um, so one of the things that I've really loved about these conversations is recognizing that not only are all of us that are moms are wired differently, we have different passions, we have different gifts and abilities, our children also all have different gifts and abilities. And so one of the beautiful things about these conversations is just recognizing um, how creative God is and how creative God is in um, the different gifts and abilities that we bring to the table as moms and recognizing that our children are gifts from him mm -hmm. and he's specifically chosen us as moms to be their, their mother. But tell me what motherhood has looked like for you as far as I know, um, you know, you were a collegiate athlete, um, you love adventure. Um, and so what are the God-given gifts and personalities that you bring to the table? How have you seen God orchestrate that in your life as a mom? Um, whether some of them may be some learning experiences of <laughs> uh, ways that we need to... Um, grow and ask God for help or <laughs> always show you those really well <laughs> <laughs> or just ways that you know you've seen wow this is really fun and you know this is great for my family because God's wired me this way to be adventuresome or to be very athletic and it's been fun as a mom so what does motherhood look like for you individually uh, it was fun listening to the newborns uh, conversation that you had because um, it's it was hard uh, going from a yearly review and a paycheck and to staying home with someone who didn't quite talk yet and and then talking to them. Um, it's I used to joke that uh, 
God, why, why did you actually call me to stay home with my kids? Because I don't really like cooking. I don't really like cleaning. I'm not that much of a domestic <laughs> diva. Um, what, what were you thinking? And just, um, I, I would jokingly say that to people. Um, but then a few years ago, uh, it kind of hit me upside the head. Um, the, the passages in Job where it says, who, who are you to question <laughs> what I've made or, or what I've called you to? Um, if I was perfectly equipped to that, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't need God as much um, in motherhood. And so it was a, it was a big um, eye opener to, okay, just because you don't do all of <laughs> domestic life um, easily or well, or you don't enjoy it, um, doesn't mean that I haven't called you to be home and to be present um, during this time period. So it really, it really validated that. Um, just God talking to Job and reminding him, I know, I know what I'm doing. I know you don't see it all the time, but. I and that can be really challenging for moms. I know there's a lot of moms who, um, you know, stay home with their children. There's a lot of working moms that continue with their career and navigate um, juggling being a mm -hmm. new mom and having a career. But I've found that for a lot of moms, when they do make that choice or God calls them, as you said, mm -hmm. to stay home for a season, um, that can be really challenging and hard, especially if you're very career driven or having to make that adjustment, like you said, of those adult conversations and then being brought into a season. Maybe you don't feel as comfortable in or it's a, a learning experience has there been a particular um i love how you brought in job of recognizing like um when god calls us to do something we do it with faith and obedience we don't always have all the answers and we don't do it um necessarily even sometimes maybe god has to change our heart in the process so what does that look like even daily as you've had to learn and grow and walking and what God says, don't question, this is what I have for you right now. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of my favorite quotes is by Elizabeth Elliot and sitting next to my quiet time chair. And it just says, um, this is the job. And, and I refer to motherhood. I think hers was more on the mission field, but uh, this is the job God, God has given me to do. Therefore, it is a gift. Therefore, it is a privilege. Um, therefore, it is an offering I can make to God in this job and not anywhere else. Um, God, I can know God's will. And in this job, he looks for faithfulness. And so that's just been a real encouragement on the days that it's not fun and, and, and grounding on the days that it is fun and it is fulfilling um, and, and encouraging uh, to, to do laundry over and over or to clean something just to have it um, dirty two seconds later. Um, that it's an act of service mm. um, and that it's, and then it's for God. It's not just for each person in your family. Mm. I, I love that. I love how you brought in uh, that it's an act of service for God mm -hmm. because if he's given us these gifts and they're not ours, but he's asked us to steward this gift well, um, then I love approaching motherhood with that servant's heart of recognizing, you know, we're not doing it for our glory. We're not doing it for our kids' glory. We're doing it for God's glory. So what a beautiful picture of just recognizing the purpose of motherhood mm -hmm. and that calling of it being a, a um, I wrote a book recently of a high calling because mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, this calling is from God even having these children are a gift from him. And so recognizing that our, our purpose is to bring him glory in that. I do have to kind of chuckle whenever you said that you weren't necessarily a um, domestic diva. Um, now I do have a cleaning obsession. I'm a little like Monica on friends and being very OCD on loving everything in its place, facing the exact right way. So I'm very obsessed on the cleaning front. However, on the cooking, I can totally identify with not being wired, not loving it. You know, I've even tried to trick myself of putting on 
fun music and pouring a glass of wine thinking that this is going <laughs> to somehow make me turn into loving cooking and it hasn't worked. Brandon, but, yep, um, I'm trying. Said, I'm trying. Yes. I said, Brandon, maybe when we were newly married, maybe if I put a TV in the kitchen, it will like make me want to hang out in there more and you know, I can watch a favorite show and, and he's like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> so keep trying. Yes, I, I'm trying. Um, but you know, we all have our gifts and abilities and that, you know, yeah. some people. Um, what is God currently teaching you right now? Um, well, it's interesting. He, uh, he teaches stuff all the time. I feel like there's been big themes, maybe in my, in my 20s or the first 10 years of marriage, I feel like it was um, margin. Um, like when Brandon stopped, when Brandon first asked if I could hang out, like our very first time we ever spent time together, uh, he said, hey, could we hang out one night? And I was like, yeah, I, I think I'm free like next Thursday. And this was Tuesday of the week before. And he seriously? Um, and so then in getting married, um, he, we just planned on, on not doing anything that first year. And it was, uh, I had something filled every time and I loved it. And that was, that was fulfilling to me and fun, but there was no, there was no margin. And so over the first 10 years, I feel like God taught me that the point of life isn't, or at least this stage of life, isn't to be constantly busy and doing something. It's to um, be purposeful with, with what we do. And there's so many good things out there, but choosing the best. And it's not what's best for me or what's best for my husband. It's what God's best is for me. And, um, and discerning that and that you can't discern that in the busyness um and you can't see which directions he's leading and guiding you when there's no margin for him to even speak or work so uh, i think that at the beginning the um was margin um and that's and that what a valuable lesson i think for all of us as mothers to um create time and space Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that, you know, um, we all can be very busy and we can use busyness as an excuse for not spending mm -hmm. time with God. But, um, you know, we make time for what's important to us. Mm -hmm. And if it's important to hear the voice of God, we're going to make and create that time so that we can know him and listen to him well. Um, one of the challenges, though, that I think that many mothers face today in the um, the blessing and curse of technology. It has amazing gifts and abilities. And even just in the, um, in the crisis that we're facing in our world today, it is a blessing to have technology for school to continue for children and for work to continue via Zoom calls. And so technology can be a blessing. I think one of the challenges, especially for moms, is the curse of um, social media and those voices that can get in our heads mm -hmm. with comparison. And you said something really valuable about not just making time for what's good, but making time for what's best and what God's calling you to do. And I think that it's really tricky when we see other people um, either being successful or doing something else well that we automatically think we should try that also. And it could be anything from making really elaborate, beautiful cupcakes to mm -hmm. being the fun mom that takes your kids on an adventure every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, you think, oh my gosh, that feels overwhelming. And so I think for moms, the struggle can be really real in comparison. Mm -hmm. How do you not let comparison be a voice in your head and how do you choose to have those blinders on when it comes to creating margin for what God's calling you to do um, and being shielded from the, um, the voices that can make us feel like we're inadequate as a mother? Um, I, think, I think that's a big reason why God gives us husbands or, or family or mentors at any stage in life to speak um, truth or reality, even when ours gets just a little bit um, off. I know, I remember like in small group, if I talked too much, which is frequently done, then I'd just get kind of a, you know, from Brandon that would say, 
all right, that's enough now. And it was helpful because I, before I was married, I didn't have somebody that would, that would back me up like that or, or help me um, in times like that. And, and I think it's found in accountability and in mentoring. I know that's one thing that has been important to me throughout, um, I guess not so much high school, but once I got to college and once I was on my own, um, I, I, don't, I don't know where the wisdom came from. <laughs> I'm sure my parents, but um, I asked my business advisor who was also a pastor's wife and just amazing um, woman of God to, to mentor me through college. And so she would have lunch with me once a week and just in relationships and school and things that I was doing or thinking or um, quiet times, things that God was teaching me, I could run anything by her. Um, I never felt uh, judgment, um, but just a listening ear and a wise, a wise counsel. Um, and I know so often it's good to have those established in different places because so often we get that wise counsel from our parents, but it's so much easier to, to listen to or adhere to oftentimes when it's spoken from a different place too. So, um, it's really important to have, uh, established mentors at, at each stage of, of life. And then as you get older to become a mentor, um, not out of, not out of pride of, oh, I have got this newlywed thing now, <laughs> now I can be a newlywed mentor, but out of um, investing and, and as a service to um, where you were not too long ago. That's so good. And the whole uh, Titus woman of the, that we're humble enough to receive counsel mm -hmm. from other people. Um, and then as God opens doors for us to be bold enough to speak truth into the lives of others. Um, let me just pause real quick and say that if any of our audience members has any questions um, for Jill, and as we're having this conversation, there is a um, question um, box down at the bottom. You can type in any questions you have, and we will try to save a few minutes at the end um, just to be able to ask any questions that you may have pressing as an audience member. Um, Jill, one of the things that as you create that margin in your life and as you, God may call you to do something that doesn't, that he's not calling someone else to do and uh, listening to the voice of God, one of the things that as I've watched and observed your life over the last few years is you've been intentional in your community. And I'm not sure if that's something that um, just is on, you know, that God called you and Brandon to or um, came out of your church, but you have been intentional to, as a mom and as a family, to invest in the lives of refugees. And what has that looked like for you? Because I know for many people that can be scary, mm -hmm. it can be intimidating, um, and it can even be something that we um, shy away from because we don't know enough or, you know, so, and I'll say even as a mom of young children, oftentimes we want to shield and protect our children um, and be guarded in who they rub up against, right, at those early ages. Um, even maybe just different parenting styles or different things that we want to expose them to. But it appears that you've had the opportunity to do something that God's called you to and to do it really well and to have a voice in the life of others and specifically in refugees. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's looked like and maybe even some of the um, challenges that you had to face as a mom and protecting your own children, but also investing in what God's called you to? Well, that's really encouraging to hear you say doing well. Um, we, we, I really only interacted with one um, refugee family uh, for the majority. Um, one, uh, as I was talking about with margin, um, what the main, one of the mainstays over the last, since I've had kids, has been um, a, a women's Bible study. We're actually all for, for everyone, but um, a Bible study fellowship, um, a women's group. And so I started looking for something that was um, during the day. And it actually, four years ago, um, we were studying the book of John and um, I was just telling someone else about Bible study fellowship and just saying, you know, you can't go through studying the Bible at that depth and with that um, 
much intentionality without being changed. You can't, you can't be in, you can't be in and attend BSF without being changed. And um, at that point in life, that's what uh, listening to God and having margin in life um, was what he was teaching me. That was when the twins were six months old and I had a two and a half year old and a four and a half year old and um, was pretty postpartumly fried. <laughs> so um, my one saving grace uh, was a babysitter once a week on Wednesday mornings. And so I had um, five hours that kept me sane. And it was, I was selfish with it. I um, tried to do the best that I could to recharge during that time because then I was much better for my family to my family. Um, and I was, I was driving past um, a bus stop and gonna get the oil changed, had lots of things on the schedule that I was gonna do and saw it was freezing cold in January, um, four years ago. And I saw someone, uh, a girl with two young kids, it looked like my kids ages, um, freezing and waiting at this bus stop. And I picked up Brandon's truck to get the oil changed and then took it back and back by 30 minutes later. And she was still there with her two boys and they had on warm coats. So they were, they were good. Um, but I just looked back in the back of his truck and he never has car seats in there, but he had two and he had my four-year-old's car seat and my two-year-old's car seat in there. And it was like, God was saying, you're supposed to stop. And I drove all the way past and all the way around the corner and was like, I am, I'm never going to live this down. I'm never going to forget this moment that I like more clearly than I've ever heard in my life heard God say, you're supposed to stop and give them a ride somewhere. <laughs> so I had to turn around in the middle of the road and go back and pick them up. And um, that's how I met um, my, one of my refugee friends um, from Iraq and her two little boys. And um, she was much younger than me, um, 15 years. So I could have almost been her mom. Um, but as a peer with someone with kids the exact same age and um, she had only been here a week and didn't speak the language and didn't know anyone um, and I gave her a ride and it was like all gestures and uh, I thought she'd been here a year based on her gesturing and uh, and from there just gave her my number and said call me if you need anything I'll, I'll help you and then that day she called and Brandon heard me in, in our room talking to her and he's like, who are you talking to that can't understand you? You're talking so loud and uh, it was hard to talk without gestures. Anyway, um, it was not at a moment where I would have said, yes, I have extra time. Let me dive in, let me invest. We were remodeling a bathroom so that we could have a second bathroom. Um, and the twins were little, but God said, uh, you're supposed to do this. This will change your life. Um, and it did. And it has. I mean, my kids, um, my kids experienced apartment complex living in neighborhoods with kids from all different cultures. And they um, played with toys and helped the boys learn English and um, they ran around the Arabic market with all the other, you know, as we went at something that I never would have been someplace like that unless I needed to, to take her there and um, experience that. So I tell anybody, if you ever want to meet a refugee, then just go to the Arabic market. They always need a ride home and, and you can give them a ride home instead of them waiting two hours for the bus. Um, but that was one of those times when, when, God said, you know what, your oil changed and stuff like that. That stuff can wait. Um, but, but obeying um, what, I, what I say is, is more important. Um, and my kids have learned a lot through that, through that experience. I remember them sitting in the car and Avery wasn't even, um, she'd known about Christ her whole life, but wasn't even a believer at that point, at point four or five, and just looking through her storybook Bible and telling the little boy about it. And she goes, mom, he is just not even listening to what I am saying. And I'm like, it's okay, honey, just keep, keep telling him. So I think it was a good experience of, um, of, of experiencing a different culture and being uncomfortable um, with those things. Because the girls at one point said, oh, I don't want to play with them. They don't understand English. And, uh, 
I said, oh, but girls, that's why, uh, that's why they need you as a friend. They don't understand English. They don't know anything about Jesus. Um, they, that's, that's why we're in their lives. That's why God has us here. And they said, oh, well, we need to tell them. And so it just, it translated into a mission field for them as well as for me. Um, anyway, so it was, it's, it was a um, learning experience um, and a blessing that God threw there at a time when I wouldn't have just picked it. That is powerful. And I think as I listen to you, how many times, again, if we're listening to that still small voice, um, and then a choice to obey or disobey, because quite frankly, as I listen to you tell that story, I think, would I stop? I mean, um, it takes a lot of boldness. Um, you know, you think um, whether it's putting your own life in jeopardy or putting your family in jeopardy as far as just what that is going to unfold and look like. Um, and yet, so often we want to have the glamour of doing something exotic, if you will, for God, like going to the mission field. And yet God always gives us a mission field wherever we are. Mm -hmm. regardless of where we live, we have a built-in mission field and, and that starts in our home, but then it explodes in the world around us and in our communities. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful testimony to listening and obeying God. Um, but also just being bold to, to walk in that obedience and to, to be a light that mm -hmm. shares who he is um, with others. And practically just someone who's new to America, what a, you know, mm -hmm. friendly, generous spirit that you had of being able to show her kindness. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's, um, it's, it may be one of the only ways that, that they see Christ. And, and I would love to say that it's ended in her coming to know the Lord and her voice and, but, but they've moved on and, and it's not necessarily that we've had the opportunity to, to, we've shared Christ with them, but for them to accept necessarily, but um, it's faithfulness in planting the seed and then in watering it and then in being there. And it's a relationship that really doesn't give you back um, much of anything, but it, but it teaches you in so many things. Um, I taught her to drive, <laughs> which was interesting. So it, um, whereas I used to be impatient and say, oh my gosh, figure out how to drive um, on the road. Um, Brandon would say that, and I would say, there could be a new refugee in that car learning how to drive. You'd be nice. Um, I've been there before. And it just gives perspective on um, life around you. Pray for them. Pray for their safety. <laughs> you know, don't brush around them. But it just, it, it's been a, a perspective that I don't know that our family would have ever encountered otherwise. And even just... Uh recognizing that we don't always know someone else's story mm -hmm. so you know be being impatient in the car that's driving slow um but you know i think when we take time to ask people their stories it does give us a an abundance of grace and understanding maybe why they they're doing what they're doing and so i appreciate that sensitivity to recognize that you know you're forever changed you know that interaction now has changed you in in multiple ways mm -hmm. um there is also as i think just about how you you walked in that active obedience and boldness because i think that there's been times that i think of one specific time um i was in africa um and i felt like god said to pray for a little girl who was um mute and deaf and so she, she couldn't hear, she couldn't speak. And I didn't. And that still haunts me as far as not walking in faith and obedience to just do what I felt like God was saying to do. And mm -hmm. so I think that we, um, we either walk into um, opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus, or we, you know, disobey and don't walk in those blessings that maybe God has to use us as his servant. And so to be, to, to be willing to always say yes when God says, you know, here's a door. Well, and that's why I was excited to see your um, last uh, girl who spoke with the um, 
on prayer and teaching on prayer. I can't wait to read her book um, because that's many people, even who aren't Christians are open to you praying for them and they want your prayers. They don't necessarily want to pray. They don't want to, you know, do anything else besides that. But so many people, if you just say, can I pray for you real quick? Mm. We'll let you. And that's just a, a, a passageway and a connection that, um, most people are really open to, I've, I've found through moms in prayer or just through interacting with people. Um, it, it's, it's a cool gateway or opportunity that God gives us. That's so true. So true. And one of the things that I really like looking at the family unit as moms and recognizing then we have that mission field at home mm -hmm. and then that mission field as a family can go forth um, and share the gospel. I think about um, making disciples becoming exponential mm -hmm. as we um, raise world changers in our home. And then as we all leave the house, it's not just me, one person going out and being a disciple maker, but now five in the Dupler family go out every day as disciple makers. What has, um, because I have observed and watched how you've been intentional in raising up your own children and teaching them the word of God, what has um, that looked like in your house as you've taught your children scripture and um, they've grown into their own personal relationship with Jesus at early ages? How have you done that for those who may be watching and are like, you know, it's how do we begin? How do you know, I don't know that my kids would even be able to show a picture book of Jesus to, you know, a refugee boy. Like, how did you do that? So what have been some ways that you can encourage moms listening and being intentional to know the word of God at an early age? Um, it's funny because I think I would be the last person that would would be a, a good example of, oh, how did you do that? Everything that I do is kind of, uh, okay, our pastor said to read to your kids a ton. So, okay, at a young age, at nine months, I'm going to start reading Bible stories to my kids. So it's just doing what um, wise people say, I jokingly, my sister-in-law, Amanda loves reading. I call it self-help books, but it's not, it's, it's, it's personal growth, like parenting books and things like that. I'm like, Amanda, can you, can you give me the cliff notes on that so that I can like get the meat, but I'm, it would take me a year to read a book like that. And, um, but, but listening to what, um, wise people around you have to say and, and doing that. So reading scripture to them from a young age and, um, teaching them, um, you know, we all start the summer with, oh, we're going to learn a new verse as a family every week. And then, of course, mine like ratcheted back to, all right, as a family every month, we're going to get this verse in. And, and um, that um, Joshua 24, 15, um, choose today was up on our marquee board, choose today who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and all the kids learned it. And then I remember um, my little six-year-old, uh, probably six months ago, just saying, Stella, you're choosing whining right now. Choose today who you will serve. And she goes, oh, mom, I know that verse. <laughs> Don't <laughs> remind me. I already know it. And so, I mean, you, you try so many times to, it's like, okay, that's awesome. Now let's apply it. <laughs> Apparently we learned the words and didn't go quite as much through the application, but, um, but it's just, teaching them over and over. It's, it's amazing the, the stages that they go through of asking the same question over and over and over, and that's how they're processing and learning. So it's, it's patience, which I don't often have, but in teaching them those things, but, but learning from wise people what to teach them. That's really good. That, that's, that's awesome, and I love her. <laughs> she has the verse down. <laughs> Just now the understanding oh. of how to implement it. That's great. Yes. I hope, I hope you've written that one down to remember. Oh yes. In her kid's book. She'll get to read that one soon. <laughs> what, um, as we start to connect the dots, um, of the things that we've been talking about, we all, um, you know, we've talked about how we all go through different trials. And one of the things as we go through trials and choosing to face joy is having that grit and resilience what are some ways that either you've experienced and plan to implement as a mom, or maybe you've already had those opportunities to um, overcome particular trials or obstacles, but then how do, what have you learned on the other side? Because I think 
So often we want to, um, we've kind of been in a helicopter and snowplow parenting of getting everything out of the way, making all the phone calls, doing all the things so that our kids have life easy, that they don't have to fall down and scrape their knee, and yet learning how to fall down and scrape your knee and get back up, you know, or, uh, you know, fall off a horse and you have to get back on the horse. What has that looked like um, for you either personally or as a mom to teach your kids the importance of failure mm-hmm. and that failure is not bad, but actually failure allows us first and foremost to recognize our dependence upon God, um, that we're not good at everything mm-hmm. and we're not going to be perfect at everything, but we need to develop and grow that muscle mm-hmm. of grit and resilience to be able to, um, to face obstacles in life. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember, um, I remember as a, a kid, my dad being my basketball coach and l- years later saying, yeah, you, I had a lot of knowledge I wanted to teach you, but you are just not very coachable <laughs> and thinking, wow, I, I, I understand why my kids aren't coachable or don't want to be teachable. But, um, one of the things we've tried to teach them and which is easy sadly for me to teach is when we mess up um uh, owning it and saying you know what mommy messed up here oftentimes mine is I got impatient or mommy yelled there and that was not the right choice I need to ask you to forgive me that was not um that was not right um or just being able and being comfortable with admitting when they're wrong uh, or, or I'm wrong and modeling that. Um, one of the, the, and I think they get that because at different instances, they'll say, oh, you were right, I was wrong. And I remember just saying, Stella, everybody just go to the bathroom. We're about to be in the car for a while. Just, just go, even if you don't have to. And Stella say, mom, no, 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 I don't have to go to the bathroom. I really don't. Just, just sit on the toilet for me for a second. And then sitting on the toilet and I'm walking out to the car and she goes, mom, you were right. I was wrong. I'm so sorry. I did have pee pee that needed to come out. (laughs) And just thinking, God, you, how many times do we need to sit down and say, God, you were right. I was wrong. I didn't know that I, that's something that I struggled with that I needed to learn. Um, But but the things that you put in my, my life that show me those things, um, I, I needed, and then I needed to speak it, to confess, you, you were right, I was wrong. So I feel like that's one thing that the kids have become comfortable with because unfortunately, they again, they've heard me say it um, on quite a few times, but that they're comfortable with saying that too. Um, that's incredible. That That's that's awesome. And I, I think, what you said so accurate because I think as we, um, you know, we want to have all the answers and we want to be right all the time. And it's hard to admit when we're wrong to have that humility. And yet, yeah, just as you pointed out that, you know, to be coachable and to be humble, to recognize that modeling that for our children, um, helps them recognize that they are going to make mistakes. And I think that having that, um, ability to be humble also builds that grit and resilience to, okay, I'm, I made a mistake. I fell down, but I know how to get back up is something that I think, um, our, our culture needs to embrace more mm-hmm. of recognizing that, um, you have to, you have to play that out and practice that because I mean, it doesn't come naturally to our sinful, prideful, um, sin nature as far as wanting to always, um, be right and and not to have that humility um, and not, and not to let failure to define us because I think oftentimes we hide when we fail because we don't want to be seen as vulnerable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well and I think that's one of the things like you were asking about that that God is teaching now um, so many of us have this innate desire to m- me especially to be on the ball to be covering all of the bases to be taking a meal to this person and having this on time and this everything going on. And it's funny because it's like God said, yeah, that lady that thinks she's on the ball, she needs twins. And, and jokingly, I just said, wow, God, okay, you want me to not feel on the ball for the next decade. And, um, and then it hit me and it was only been in this last year that it's like, 
yes. And I was trying to, I was struggling with why, why do I want, why do I desire to be like that? Because God really can't use me in that state when I've got everything under control and I don't need him as much. Um, I'm not, I'm not really very usable. Um, so, so God, what's the deal? Why, why is that something that we so often desire? Um, but don't, don't necessarily submit to. So I think it's been, um, a teaching, a teaching time in, um, having to ask for help. I remember our pastor's wife gave me a compliment, which I didn't see a compliment at the time, but during the first two years of the twins life, I was asking for help constantly. And it was so humbling. And she goes, Oh yeah, you're really so good at that. You'll just ask for help all the time, whenever you need. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> and she goes, no, really, I, I've learned to just, whenever I need help, just ask for help. And um, <laughs> so, so it was a compliment, but I didn't feel that way at the time. But, but those are the things that God teaches us is to let people help, let the body of Christ work um, and, and serve when, when you need help and, and then helping in turn. Um, but that he can most use us when we're clinging to him for dear life or for sanity or for guidance or the, or the will or power to not yell at our kids when they just fry us. So um, mm. we need him most when we're not on the ball. So it's when he can really use us. That's so good. And, and yeah, pride gets in the way of our, our being humble to ask, you know, mm. it's pride that often prevents us from being able to recognize that we need help and mm -hmm. willing to ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, what are, um, one of the things that I've enjoyed um, asking our different panelists is recognizing, okay, we're moms and we're investing in um, our children that God's given us. And um, what a beautiful, holy opportunity that we have um, to make that investment. And yet I think it's so important that we look in the rear view mirror and recognize what our own mothers have made in that significant impact in our lives. What would you say is one thing that you've learned from your mom that has helped shape and mold you into who you are today? I was thinking on that long and hard and I thought of a million different things. Um, but I think, I think the biggest one was um, contentment in, in a broad, a broad um, sense because, um, this, as, as I grew up with them, um, in, we, li we lived in a small house in Hewitt and then, um, built a house out in, um, China Spring and it was land and we worked and they cleared that land for five or six years and, um, and then they built a house on it and we slowly finished the house and they built the house debt free. And mom always tells the story of, yeah, there was a house for sale about three years into owning and clearing that land that I wanted so bad. And your dad just said, Cindy, I think we just need to wait. I don't think we need to get another mortgage and let's just, let's just keep going on this route. And she goes, I dug my heels in. I wasn't really excited about it, but I submitted and I've never been more pleased um, that I did that. So just in learning from, um, the ways that, I mean, waited years and years through clearing land and through building a house. And I mean, <laughs> she jokingly says, I just now 20 years later got the last crown molding I wanted up there finished, but just, just doing things, um, slowly and as they had time and as they had money, but not, um, not paying for things that you couldn't afford or, um, doing things and getting things instantly, but waiting and being content in the waiting. Um, I know my dad's mom's big, um, mantra, which my mom really took on was enjoy the moment. So it's helped me remember to put down my phone or not let my kids see me on my phone because I don't want them to say, Oh, what is that? They're always really interested in it. What's this thing that's more important than me and what I want or need right now. Um, but but to enjoy the moment and to be in the moment and snap a picture here and there, but um, to to live it and to retell those stories 50 times when we get old and forget we've told those stories, but to to have experienced it to the fullest in that moment. So I, I think my mom has really 
taught me um, contentment and um, patience, delayed gratification, um, and, and learning learning from others. Um, yeah. And what a, a great example of also doing hard things and having the grit and determination to stay the course and, and, and that being a very long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. um, also, another th thing in listening to you say that is the, the protection and the, um, and the walking and obedience of mm -hmm. what your dad had said, you know, he felt was the right thing to do. And just that, you know, I think sometimes not to go down another uh, <laughs> rabbit trail, but I think um, in today's society, um, our, you know, are arching our backs as women in um, thinking that the word submit is a bad word and recognizing that it's really a protective word. And when we have to submit our lives to God and, um, and even as women, we have the opportunity and the protection and privilege mm -hmm. to be able to um, walk in submission um, to our husbands because then that's a protection that we get to, I think of it as a luxury mm -hmm. you know, that God, um, our husbands are called to um, be accountable for their families. And so um, you know, I, I see that as a luxury as women that we have that protection um, mm -hmm. when we walk in obedience to what our husbands, you know, feel God's calling them to do and to mm -hmm. be able to walk in that protection. Um, so not being a bad word um, mm -hmm. that our society wants to, to label as a negative as women. Um, as we begin to just wrap up this conversation, um, I, I've learned so much from you. I'm inspired by you, encouraged. And as we, as moms, embrace this whole idea that motherhood, um, mothers are leaders. Motherhood is the opportunity to invest in lives that are gonna be CEOs and be teachers and nurses and doctors and and we have the opportunity to have our fingerprints by god's grace and mercy to help shape and mold these world changers mm -hmm. what is it about embracing motherhood as leadership is important for our world why is it important for the world to view mothers as a leadership role I mean, I think in, in general, I, it's funny, I always thought stay-at-home moms laid in beds and read, read books all day. <laughs> I was a little sorely mistaken. So uh, when the twins go to kindergarten, I'm sure I'll try to, to live that one out. But um, it's just, uh, I feel like it's just deemed, and I even catch myself slipping into it as um, menial or, or, less less important um but so often just I feel like it's me me or our culture missing the big picture of like you're saying the unit um as the family and um a strong marriage or a strong um servant uh example to them um as as a way that God leads leads our families and leads our lives and, and grows them to who he wants them to be. Yeah. And, and just kind of piggybacking off of that. One of the things that I think um, you've described remarkably well is the whole idea of servant leadership, because I think that you've given several examples about how to be a servant leader is being able to be asked for help, to be humble, to um, teach your children that, um, you know, I was wrong. Um, and so as we develop that grit um, in life to do hard things, to choose joy, I think servant leadership is something that stands apart from what the rest of the world describes as a leader. Because mm -hmm. um, often in our culture, we can see a leader as, you know, charging full steam ahead. Um, and having the ideas and being the voice and being the loudest person in the room. And yet Jesus modeled for his servant leadership. And quite frankly, the people that I admire the most mm -hmm. and that make it on the, um, you know, that top five list of people that are my heroes in life really model servant leadership. 
what does that look like for us as moms to, to walk that out as mm -hmm. servant leaders, as we raise the world changers that we've been given with grit and grace? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think Brandon, I feel like displays this really well, but, but Christ teaches us through his example, humility, and that as, as leaders and as world changers, we, um, what, what we have to say, what we have to share um, in sharing the gospel isn't palatable without humility. So, so while we're raising, um, desiring to raise confident um, kids who know who they are, um, who know who they are in Christ, who are confident in um, the way God's made them uniquely, and um, who are thankful for that, um, I think the biggest thing is, is teaching them humility in servant leadership, because whatever they have to say or whatever they have um, to contribute to the world isn't quite as palatable unless it's, um, unless it's couched in and clothed in humility in the way that they say things. And it's funny because you see the way that you do things or the way that you teach things come out in small versions and it comes back at you and you're like, oh, <laughs> let's tweak that a little bit, or maybe I'll get that right with the next kid as far as teaching or training it. Um, but but in, in the way that you humbly um, coach, I guess, instead of my personality is so much of a dictator parent that just says, you need to do this because I said so, and because this is the, you know, the right thing to do. Whereas Brandon comes at it from, from more of a, a humble, um, standpoint that explains to them why why we want to follow Christ and in, in, in his example and look how he was humble when he was teaching this person this thing so whenever we're trying to teach someone something or share something um, we, we want to be humble and honoring um, and, and hear from them first and value their input and stance um, before we just blaze on in our in our opinions and in our um, sharing or our agenda. Um, so I think I think what marked Christ in his life was humility, and so that's what um, that's what needs to mark us in our in our lives. And um, Brandon and I are both firstborn, so strong personalities and loud and. Um, vivacious and so our kids are, are just are big like that but that can be so intimidating too to quieter kids or to just to anyone else to people who aren't used to that loudness um, so so learning and understanding um, humility I think is is a, a big key is going to be a big key for them so that's been the adventure in in teaching them from from that standpoint and that and and that's so amazing how God brings us together of different personalities, even as you're saying with you and Brandon. And I find that so true with um, Todd and myself is, you know, we have different um, ways that we can complement each other to, to point our children to Christ and to come at it with those, you know, more direct and then the, uh, you know, softer approaches as far as how we um, relate to our children and teach them. And, and I love just how everything in this conversation has been woven together with, um, you know, as, as I listen to you, I think about the, the strong, confident, athlete, adventuresome woman that you are, and you bring to the table these amazing, strong gifts as a mother, um, and, and yet having to put into action that servant leadership of, even to be coachable, to be humble, to, re to help teach your children that grit and resilience to do hard things and to do hard things well. Um, but even as you interacted with um, the refugee family of being willing to listen to God's voice, to stop, um, because as you, as you just pointed out, you know, a servant leader has a stronger voice. And, you know, that, that refugee woman doesn't need to be told that it's cold outside. She knows it's cold outside. And so how we approach people is so important and how we have a voice in their lives of having that, um, 
that servant's heart and um, and being able to be permitted mm-hmm. a, a voice of truth for the people that we interact with mm-hmm. um, and to have a platform. So I think you are doing a remarkable job. I love I'm just listening to you, learning from you, and I so appreciate your time and to be able to share your story, to be able to share your heart um, for what God's teaching you and how um, motherhood has been an adventure for you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing with our audience. And um, it's been a blessing to be able to have this conversation. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to share was um, a, a quote from Sally Clarkson for all of us. The most important factor in being successful as a mother is to turn our hearts to God and to seek his will and to entrust our kids to him. And later she says, when we face the Lord at the end of our lives, he will ask us, what did you do with those precious eternal beings that I entrusted into your hands? Did you sacrifice your own life to give them my life? Did you pass on my purposes? Did you do the work in your children that will result in praise to my name throughout all eternity? And that's at my kitchen um, kitchen window, because that is the perspective that I want to keep. Um, and it's just a, such an inspiration to me. So, and you are as well, Shimon. So I, I really appreciate you and everything that Passion for Moms um, is doing. Well, thank you. And thank you um, for being a part of this conversation to our audience members. Thank you for listening. And um, I hope that each one of you are encouraged and challenged just as you face your own um, adventure as a mother and recognizing that we have the opportunity to be leaders and uh, to walk in that faith and obedience as we raise world changers for Jesus. Thank you for joining us. And we will be back with you next week, every Tuesday two o'clock Eastern time. And we hope to see you again next week. Thanks so much, Jill. Thanks.